All right. Let's get started here. Um, that uh, so quick reminder, uh, Saturday is the um, all floor worship session starting at one o'clock. Uh, then at uh, two, we'll transition to the senior advice for the freshmen. Um, at this point, you should have contacted me um, if you're not planning on being here. Um, otherwise, my expectation is that you will be here and participating in those activities. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. The, I would encourage you, I've been watching what's been going on the CS Capstone Slack channel. I would encourage you maybe to work a little bit more on having a better organized session. I think if you kind of play it by ear, that it will not go as well as you're hoping. Having a more structured session, I think, would be who you. Um, so that's my encouragement for, for all of you that way. Um, let me see. Are there, and that part of the session then should probably take around 90 minutes. Um, are there questions that you have for me about, uh, about that? Yeah. You said we should better plan what the session is going to look like. What yes. would a well done session look like? Um, so, welcome, gentlemen. Um, so, a well done session should um, have an idea of, um, I think these are the topics uh, that are going to be talked about and the order that they're going to be talked in. Have a rough idea of how long each of those will take. Uh, so, so that um, you know if you're running too long on a particular topic. Like if you say, we want to go through these 20 topics or if we want to go through these five topics um, and an hour has gone by and you're on topic two, um, hopefully everyone knows that you're running behind. But if you're on topic four or eight, do you know if you're behind or not? Um, if you are behind, is that okay? And you're just going to scrap questions, right? Um, Th those are those are things that you kind of need to have an idea of, of how you're going to act. Um, I think another thing that it would look like is that you have a designated spokesperson, at least to open up the session and to run as kind of like the MC for for what's going on so that the students have someone that they see as being in charge and knowing what's going on. Um, that that person um, can kind of, e even if they're not speaking answers to the students, can, uh, if, if you want to be really tight to a schedule, can move that schedule on or um, can make it clear that you're, you're skipping some of the questions or, or whatever the case is. But if everyone is in charge, it ends up being like no one's in, in charge kind of thing. Um, I, I think um, it probably looks like uh, you have uh, some sort of priority, like this is a more important question than, than this is a question, a less important question. Um, if you do plan on breaking up in groups, it probably looks like having the group better organized. I don't think that the freshmen we'll all feel comfortable if you just say, find someone to meet up with. Uh, some of them will because they're on your wings on the floor, you have a, a relationship with them, but some of them don't. Um, and so they, it, it, uh, it could turn out that some students all gravitate to, to one section and other sections are unequal. So I, I would encourage you to have a little bit more um, formal way of breaking the, the students up in, into to groups. 
Yes. Uh, if, if that's the case, then can we get some sort of a roster of all the freshmen? Yes, I can do that. Um, I'll do that uh, after class and post that into the Capstone channel. So you have a list of, of names for, for the freshmen. Mm -hmm. Can that roster include majors? Yes. I will do my best on that. Um, let me see what else would I encourage. Um, the, the last thing uh, I'll say along that regards is uh, I would expect that everyone has an idea of how they're going to participate. So am I going to answer this question or am I going to be quiet on this question? Am I leading a small group or, or not? Um, and so that you don't show up the day of um, saying, I'm going to wing it and I'm just going to say what I think of, but that you actually have an idea of what you want to say. Because if you wing it, that's when you tend to run long, actually. Right? If you've ever heard the saying about editing, right? it's harder to edit a paper. It's also harder to edit your speech. <clears throat> um, so if you don't know what you're going to say, you ramble. I ramble. Most people ramble. Right? Uh, maybe our president's the best example of that. But um, the, the idea is that um, you think about what you're going to do, and you can say it well, and you can say it concisely. Uh, and, and so, um, so that having that plan for each of you individually, um, is, is important as well. So more than just knowing what questions are going to be asked, but knowing what, what answers you are going to provide and which answers you're going to let others provide. Does that help clear things up? All right. Cool. Um, I am recording this um, because I know that, you know, a lot of the athletes have to um, leave in about 15, 20 minutes. Um, and after class, I will put up the video for this as well as last week's video. I um, have been way late on doing that. So make sure that you, you catch those videos. I think our discussion last week was, was interesting, especially uh, if you haven't done any sort of investments, hopefully it was at least a pointer in the right direction. Um, so let's get started. Uh, today's topic for our book was uh, finding a church. Um, show of hands, how many people have felt like you had to find a church, church previously, that this is something that you had to do already? Okay. okay. Um, so um, then let me ask this question. What, um, what actions or what strategies or what um, Things have you, have you done that you guys, when when you um, look for churches, you found uh, successful or helpful, useful to to find a, a church in those situations? Yeah, David. Um, Billy said Taylor, word of mouth was somewhat useful, but I quickly learned that other people's opinions of what they wanted are different than what I wanted. So honestly, just going to a bunch of places and trying it out, having a list in mind of like what I wanted. So for instance, I wanted a multi-generational church. I didn't want like a tailor called student church. I wanted a church that was established in its community that did things. It wasn't just a Sunday morning church. And so inside that list of things, I would just go and see if it fit like the most important ones. And if not, I would trust them out. Okay. okay. Um, before I get other questions, because I, I other answers, because I think it's important. Uh, I want to follow up on the one thing you said. You had this list of characteristics. How did you come up with the um, churches that had those characteristics? Um, I didn't necessarily come up with churches. I just found churches that were nearby and went to them, at least as a freshman, because you can't necessarily choose what church you can go to because you don't have a car. Uh -huh. So you see who's going on your floor. You talk to someone like, what is this church about, even just vaguely, and then if it somewhat fits, you go and try it out. 
Okay. Okay. What other things have you done that you you found effective in, in identifying a good church or identifying a bad church? So, so I remember when I was trying to find a church for the first time here, I was I was primarily concerned with like what are they actually teaching me? Is it actually worthwhile? And so like, the first church I went to was was just like just super slapstick comedy and then making fun of rich people. So, like I don't want to be here. So then the second one. So see, seeking out biblical uh, based teaching. Yeah, there you go. Um, I think it was a really like important step for me when I realized that I should stop looking for my home church in Indiana. Uh huh. Because I think whenever I came in as a freshman, I was kind of like very naive and I was like, oh. The way of the race is the right way to do it, and I don't want to find that again. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Like, that's obviously really dumb. Um, but like once I figured that out, and I was able to like sort of like what Jason said, like figure out like what well, my priorities were for myself, and not just like what I always been raised in. That like was a lot more effective in helping me find something that I wanted for myself. Mm -hmm. So so being willing to experience something new or something different, as long as it still you know followed. Uh, the what you're off to talk about the, the non-negotiable, right? Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah, Adam. I think for me as a freshman, and, and it's funny because I feel like freshman church hunting is definitely not going to be the same as like post-college church hunting because the priorities are a little bit different. Um, and for me, when I was a freshman, I kind of was trying to um, use. Uh, the church that I chose as a way to kind of cultivate uh, relationships with uh, some of the older guys on my floor that I, that I thought were spiritually solid. Uh, so I identified a couple of those guys and tried out church with them uh, to kind of see what the experience was like in terms of like, theology and like going through the non-negotiables. Uh, and then if the non-negotiables were, were there, uh, then I, I stuck around so that I could have like that mentor figure in my life would be just a little bit ahead of me, have that solid church and be able to use that as a, a facility for developing that sort of that sort of relationship what uh follow up on that yep. uh, you said you think it will be different come the spring mm -hmm. summer than it was as a freshman what what priorities are going to change that will make it different yeah think? well i think so the, i mean the great thing about taylor is you know the community is already kind of handed to you and so i had already felt like i had found good uh christian community uh within my floor and so my main goal in finding a church is finding a church that would help kind of uh, supplement uh, what I already found that I had, where I feel like in, in the coming summer, my, my priority will be actually finding that community itself. Mm. What do you think that will look like? What do you think Christian community will look like in, in the, the churches that, that you land in? I think as the book mentioned, you kind of have to get rid of the misconception that our community has to be people of the same age as us. So we might be able to find some other people, especially at a church that caters to three younger demographics. But um, if we're expecting to find a close new group of friends who are all in their early 20s from our church, we may or may not be able to find good guys. Okay. So really, um, embracing the multi-generational aspect of the church. What else? Yeah, Lauren. Uh, you have to be, you know, you be present. Like, don't just show up on Sunday for an hour and then leave. Like, uh -huh. You have to invest yourself in the church. It, uh, maybe bang in, you know, it's not like in a freshman year, you have to invest yourself in the floor and the school or instead of going home every weekend. What do you think that means to invest in your church? Um, to me, get involved in a small group. Um, I'm, I want to find a church that is very good volunteering, so volunteer with whatever they do. Um, volunteer within the church on Sundays, as well as at the week or on Saturdays. Um, yeah. I think I saw your hand. Yeah. Uh, another thing I would say, too, is 
we shouldn't we shouldn't expect our um, relationships to develop at quite the same pace that they did here because here like not only are you going to church with people you're also living with those people and you're working uh, well quote unquote working you're, you're going to school with them so like you're spending a significant portion of your day with kind of the same people over and over again that's not really going to be the case after this like you're going to have like the people you go to church with the people that you go to work with um, and you're just not going to be around people quite as much, so the, those relationships are going to develop at a different pace, I think. Mm. <clears throat> what are the things that have you found that have, have been helpful to, to find a, a church? Yeah. I know when my brother, my oldest brother was searching for a church back at home, his two biggest strategies were looking up the church's mission thing or a statement of faith on their website mm -hmm. and then taking the pastor out to lunch and talking with him about mm -hmm. what the church believes. Mm -hmm. And those churches to find churches that were either weak in doctrine or were just trying to cater to, to the young quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me let me follow up on that a little bit because I think that's a, a really great thing to do in a lot of churches especially in the fall but some churches where they have a lot of new people come come through them will have like a um, new visitor sunday where they'll, they'll try to at least introduce you to the pastoral staff um, and what the opportunities are available um, and maybe they might even have like a i don't want to call it a membership class but we'll have like a introduction to uh, our church so that you know, you know, what are the volunteer opportunities? What are our values in our mission statement? What kind of, of teaching are we going to, to focus on? You know, where, you know, what is, um, who are the, the leadership team and, and so forth? Um, I would definitely encourage you to take advantage of of those um, opportunities as as you land in, in in churches to to be able to be more well informed about what, what you're uh, what you're potentially um, getting into and more more easily able to make these kind of evaluative kind of ideas um, quickly. Yeah, I would say to go along with that, a lot of churches, at least when I was looking, if you inquire about membership, they have like documentation already on hand, so like they had a statement of faith booklet already printed out, other people work and stuff. So then like, so I actually joined a member of that church, but um, having all of that and being able to read through it your own pace is a good thing. So let me kind of flip the question a little bit. Have you found any certain activities or actions to, to be either um, not helpful, in other words, they don't do a good job of helping you distinguish between different churches, or even worse, anti-helpful, then they lead you in the wrong direction towards a, a particular church? Again, Go for it. Like one of his things that he looked for at first a little bit was like was the quote unquote diversity, where that turned out not being very helpful because a lot of churches that build themselves off of diversity are usually targeting diversity over other important things. So that turned out to be not actually a very useful characteristic mm. to find in the church. Interesting. It does look for us. Yeah. I think just like expecting perfection is a really easy to change mindset when you're mm -hmm. like looking for churches because I think 
it's important but difficult to remember that the church is made up of humans and we're never always being perfect. So I think that's like what got me when I was coming to Tara like with your mouth is I kept like going to churches and I would only see the flaws. Mm. And like I needed to get to the point where it's just like everybody's going to have flaws and I just need to decide what's most important. Mm -hmm. So I think like what the author recommended in like like time boxing your church search uh -huh. could be like a really helpful way to like force yourself to not get like caught up in the cycle of yeah. all these things bad. Yes, yes, definitely. I think this happened to me personally, and I know talking to other graduates, it, it's not atypical. A variant of what Ariel is talking about, where you, you're seeking perfection, is um, maybe you're not seeking perfection. You, you, you have that intellectual understanding, but you've experienced chapel here at Taylor. And I'll, I think a lot of graduates expect church to have the same kind of experience as they experience here at chapel. And I want to warn you about that from, from the following perspective. Uh, one is um, that chapel has rotating speakers, right? So we oftentimes are inviting people from off campus, maybe even around the country. Maybe this semester is a little bit different, right? Well, I guess with the so far. But, you know, we're, and, and so they're coming here and they're kind of like giving us their star sermon, right? Maybe they just finished writing a book and so they've really distilled these ideas together. Um, maybe they've given this talk two, three, 20, 50 times, I don't know, right? Because they travel a lot and do that. And so uh, most of the time, the, the speakers in, in chapel give a pretty polished, well thought out, stimulating, um, talk about, uh, about whatever they're, they're bringing, right? And you kind of get upset when it's not like <laughs> that, right? Um, but that's not kind of, that doesn't kind of fit the experience that you're going to be in if you just think about what, what has to take place. If, if you're the pastor of a church, uh, you have to come up with a sermon not once a semester or once a, a year to deliver your star sermon. But you're having to do this every single week. You have to come up with, with the, the new topic. And maybe this week you couldn't put that time into that sermon because you, you had to work on pastoral care because someone really got sick and you were in the hospital taking care of the people from, from that angle. And so you couldn't focus on getting deep into your biblical study. Or, um, or maybe, uh, <clears throat> Uh, you know, it's your, your week off and you have to get someone to, to replace you to speak for you. And they're not a, a typical pastor. And so what, what they talk about is, is they're, they're not the best uh, public speaker. They're not the, the best at, at sharing their insights into the physical um, learning or, or um, and, and you're basically, as a pastor, you're, you're having to do this week after week after uh, week. And um, then you start to naturally um, start to lean on certain themes uh, because they're important to you or, or um, uh, you're, you know, if maybe they become a little bit of a crutch or they become kind of a uh, cliche for, for, for you. I know that at every church that I've been to, um, the people who've tended there long enough can tell you certain stories that the, the pastor has repeated two, three, fifty times, you know, however many times it is, right? Because that was an important thing in their life and they kind of draw back to it multiple times from, from the, the pulpit. Um, which is not something you hear when you only hear uh, that that person once a month or once a, a, a year. <clears throat> On top of that, we've got you know very professional um, uh, sound staff, um, and you don't tend to see a lot of uh, AV issues uh, from the stage. You um, you have a rotation of worship bands. 
and, and, and the students that um, play in them work really hard to, to do a, a really good job um, and probably spend more time than a lot of church worship bands uh, have time to do. So the, the whole chapel experience um, for me kind of set this false expectation about the high quality um, of, of the entire experience. Um, and it was really, it was really hard for me to find a, a church that even, that could um, meet the, those kind of expectations. And I did have to tear them down, not because I was trying to say that the church had to be perfect. I was, I was just trying to have it match my past experiences, right? Um, and so uh, I do think you you uh, want to um, have a bit of a uh, understanding, uh, lenient, graceful approach to whichever churches you, you attend, because I, I do not think that they will have the same um, experiences as you uh, have had here in, with uh, chapel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what else have you have you tried that hasn't been successful? Yeah, um, I started going to church my sophomore year with my older sister and her husband at the time. I can't remember if they're good. Anyways, uh, there's a small church in the area that the average age was like 60 to 70. Um, and they just did help leading worship. Uh -huh. And also trying to bring young people into the church. So uh, it kind of became a very like service oriented Sunday morning, uh -huh. which felt good because Prior to that, it felt like every church I was going to, I was just talking about afterwards, like, oh, did I like it? Do I feel comfortable here? What can I get out of it? And so instead, this was like, how can I help these people out on the serve? So that felt very right at the time. But after a few months of that, it just became very dry in the other way because I wasn't really gaining anything. I wasn't growing. There was no like spiritual growth and development that was happening. I was just serving out of it mm -hmm. the spot. And so mm -hmm. I stopped going for that reason. Uh -huh. um, so I kind of realized that I need to build. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, kind of a counterpoint to what, what Lauren was talking about earlier, right? Which uh, I, um, I, I really like how you pointed out uh, Kendall, that having that others mindset is a really positive I experience. I think um, it's easy to get self-centered in our evaluation of, of a church. It can be very easy to ask, what's it doing for me? And what what am I learning? What, it, what uh, am I experiencing? Um, and to to be missing that I think is is um, or to to only be having that experience I think is missing a big part of the church I think Lauren was was right on when she talked about wanting to have a service minded um, aspect to the church but Kendall your your point is is very uh, spot on that that we can go to the other extreme with, with that as well, right? That we can completely uh, dry ourselves out. Um, for me, the the picture I like to visualize when it comes to this is um, a, a jar with a hole in the bottom. Um, and so, uh, I need to be constantly be being, and that I'm that jar with the, the hole in the bottom, but I need to be constantly being filled with water to keep my jar full, but it, it's going to leak out. And, um, and, and so um, hopefully I'm not just kind of 
spurting that water out wherever, but I'm, I'm, I'm aiming, so to speak, that water in some sort of intentional manner that I'm investing in uh, Sunday school or that I'm investing in leading a small group or whatever. And so that the, the water that's coming into me and filling me up and making me new and refreshed and whole is, is being poured out into other uh, broken vessels as well and that kind of can flow outward from, from there. Um, and so if we're missing that, that pouring in part, yeah, it just dries up uh, and becomes brittle and easily broken. Um, <clears throat> but if we, to, to push this analogy to its extreme, if we just kind of let, if we kind of stop her up that hole, it becomes kind of like a, um, a cesspool of water that isn't being renewed and re re refreshed. Um, and, you know, algae and bacteria and all these things begin growing in their place where we don't want them to grow. And I think there's a very uh, apt spiritual connection to, to that analogy. <clears throat> so we need to try to have both ends of that being poured into and being and pouring out of towards of. So with those kind of ideas in, in mind, I know having read a lot of the things that you guys have been writing in response to this book, a lot of you anticipate going somewhere new after graduation, not necessarily going back home, um, either because you just Think that's going to happen or maybe that's an intentional choice of, of yours um, so I'd like to ask more of you kind of the question I asked Daisy to begin with when you get to that new place and it's your first week there and you're thinking about the upcoming Sunday and I'm going to go to a church what's the first thing you're going to do to try to find a church where especially if, if this doesn't apply to you, please play along with the game. But you're it's such a new place that you don't have someone to say, hey, what church do you go to yet? That's how new of a place it is to you. What are you going to do in that circumstance to find that first church or those first few churches to attend? Yeah, I would say I would start at the church I am now and see if anybody knows any churches in the area because mm. people are surprisingly spread out from where they come from. And if that is not an option, I would start in the denomination that I used to be, which is Southern Baptist, and look for people or look for churches nearby that is in that association okay. that doesn't like have to. Uh huh. Uh huh. Just to get it wrong. What else? Say that loud, Kendall. Google search for what? Uh, church in the name of the city. Okay, that's going to give you, if it's any metropolitan area, that's going to give you thousands of responses. How are you going to filter that effectively? Maybe add a with free coffee. With free coffee, okay. <laughs> What else? I mean, I did I did the 90s equivalent of that since Google literally was n not even invented yet when I was trying to find churches when I went to when I graduated. For me, it was the phone book. Do you guys know what phone books are? Yeah. Uh, the yellow pages, right? I actually looked up the churches section of the yellow pages. But even that, I had hundreds of churches to choose from, right? Like, how do I, 
how do I even figure out what the first one I should go to is? Yeah. Write a program. To do what? To sort them by criteria. By which criteria? Whichever ones you want. I'm looking for whichever ones you want. What criteria would you put to initially in your program? Uh, I don't know. I presumably I come up with it before that. Okay. Yeah, sure. You could uh, trust Google's algorithm because it already knows everything about you. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so scary. <laughs> Yes, Dave. So for criteria, like if you want a certain size, like I like small churches, you could look for a small church. Mm. If you want a church that like is a Sunday school program, just a surprisingly large number, don't even have that. Mm -hmm. You can look for Sunday school programs. You could look for like what women's programs they have or men's programs or whatever, and just to see what their different stuff looks like as a baseline. Solution is pick one and go. Just pick one and go, yeah. <laughs> you are going to have to do that. Well, uh, I think uh, you do have to, in a certain sense, be, be willing to um, try some things out that you don't know if they're going to be a good fit or not. You, you have to be willing to explore or experiment. Um, you also have to, there are just too many churches to try everything. Um, and so the, the time boxing idea that, that Ariel mentioned from, from your book is also helpful. Because uh, there is always another church. There is no, always another option. There is always potentially a better thing. So kind of another idea that your author talked about earlier, you know, hearing God's voice. Um, what, what does God want for me? Choosing between two good options. Choosing a church can sometimes be that way, right? There, it's not like, well, hopefully, most of those churches are, are good, and you're not choosing between a good church and a bad church, uh, although maybe that choice does come up occasionally. So uh, there needs to be uh, a sense of um, finding something that is, that is good and, and, and going with it. I will give you some things that maybe sound trite, but I think they're also valuable. I, I, I think it is also valuable to consider distance. Um, and the reason why, um, I'll give you, uh, and distance uh, will be relative. So when we were in Chicagoland, my wife and I um, attended a church um, that was um, relatively close by, but there were a lot of people who didn't live, say, 10 or 15 minutes away from the church. Because in a metropolitan area, living 10 or 15 minutes away is, is hard to, to, to find. Right? There's, a, there's a lot of people who travel far. Uh, in, in fact, when my, my wife's daily commute one way for work was an hour. So, um, so to and and when we would talk about that with other people in Chicago land, people were like, oh yeah, sure, that that makes sense. I had the same kind of commute this this spring um, during sabbatical. An hour commute feels normal in a in a big city. So traveling, say, a half hour to church, sure, no big deal. That's that doesn't that's that's totally normal and just part of living in in a city. But when we moved here to Taylor, and we were starting to to look for churches here, one of the churches that we were very excited about, and we felt like we really connected uh, theologically. We liked the pastor. Um, we, we like the people there, um, and we thought it was a very uh, good fit and one that we could um, 
see ourselves going to long term was down in Muncie. And that was enough to prevent us from going to, to that church because we knew that unlike Chicago, a half hour commute to church is seen like crazy here. But, and what we what it felt like is that if we did that, we would be separating ourselves from the rest of the people who attended that church in Muncie. Um, and that we wouldn't be able to have the, the community that we knew was so important about being in a church because we'd constantly be having to go down to Muncie and it would be, always be a struggle to find people to come up and, and visit us here um, in far away Upland. Okay. Um, and so that was an intentional choice uh, that we made that had nothing to do with the biblical ideas at that church or being able to serve or anything like that. It was a very pragmatic decision because we knew what the implications uh, of it were. Okay, which um, so so that's an example that um, most people don't tend to talk about, but I, th I think it's important to to understand some of these other factors that we don't normally think about when going to a church. Um, I think um, uh, I think you do need to um, understand uh, what how the church um, envisions you plugging into the to the larger corporate body. Do they expect you just to show up on Sunday and be entertained? Do they expect you to be fully invested um, in, in the church? Are, are, do they need that from you? Um, do they push you in those directions? Or do, you know, I think it's really important to, to know what what the, the church um, kind of ethos it is um, and, and what the, the people who intend, attend um, do um, and looking at uh, looking at that wisely. Um, and um, One of the one of the things that my wife and I have done is uh, similar to Joseph's brother. We have actually kind of interviewed the pastor of the various churches uh, that we um, intended on uh, attending to be able to have that kind of a conversation. Like, what what do you envision for this church? in three years and five years down the road. How, how can we help you um, make that vision a reality? What, what, is, what is our role in, in, in the church going to look like? And how, how do we fit in? Are we going to be um, able to, to contribute and, and, and uh, help further the kingdom through this particular uh, church? Uh, and uh, I think when you have that one-on-one that -on -one or two-on-one, in, in our case, conversation, uh, it, it's very revealing. One of the questions that I like to ask, uh, because I've had to do this now several times, is to ask the pastor, how are they able to be spiritually fed? I don't know if you've ever thought about that specifically, but that's a really hard question for a lot of pastors to be able to answer. Uh, for most pastors, it's difficult because they're not able to be invested in by anyone who attends their church. Uh, it's kind of, there's, there's kind of this weird dynamic that takes place where the people who attend the church expect certain um, 
spiritual maturity from from their pastors and um, if you really are going to be invested in by someone else they need to know you deeply and you need to know them deeply and that includes your faults and your failures and most people don't want to know that their pastor has those things um, and and so most pastors cannot get uh, get that internally through their own church. They can't attend a small group and be invested in. They can't confide in this small group of people effectively. Um, uh, and so you you need to ask your pastor how that how that happens uh, for 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 him or her that that you that they have some mechanism. Uh, maybe it's part of the denomination that they're part of, and the churches, the, the churches in the area, the pastors all get together, and that's a, a small group for them, and that becomes an effective way. So one of the re one of I think the lingering reasons why denominations can be still a, a very effective mechanism. Um, they can, um, there's others. Uh, but that's a, a very powerful thing. Maybe they have always had a mentor um, who has been investing in, in them um, that's not necessarily connected to the denomination. Maybe it was through seminary. Maybe it was someone even before they entered the pastorate who invested in them and encouraged them to become a pastor and to be, uh, be enrolled in ministry. Um, maybe it's the pastoral staff itself at the church is big enough that they can invest in each other. I don't know what it is, but then there needs to be something there. You need, and you need to figure out uh, what it is. Maybe they won't give you the full details, but you can see that, that they have something in place and, um, and it's available. And the reason why it's important is because if it isn't there, then the pastor is going to get the same experience that Kendall was talking about. They're just going to get dragged to the ball. There, there's, there's only so much that they can give out to the congregation. Uh, and sometimes it can be a really long time, but there is eventually going to be a breaking point uh, for them. So try, try to figure that out. Um, I do think denominations can be helpful because they kind of give guide rails. Like these are the kind of things that our churches believe in and kind of like our churches ha have this kind of belief system and maybe they approach uh, teaching scripture in a, a similar way. We, they've all gone through the same seminary together and so they've got the same training. Um, they, they tend to be in that denomination because they have similar beliefs as the the, the others uh, around them and so forth. I do think um, those are, are helpful. I do not think they are as helpful as they used to be because I think a lot of churches um, uh, <clears throat> are more willing to, to buck some of those traditional denominational borders that maybe 50 years ago were, were much tighter and, and, and more rigid. And there's a lot more non-denominational churches where that just doesn't help um, in, in the first place. But that can be a, a helpful thing for, for sure to kind of give you a first guess at, at what things are like. Um, one thing that I did that maybe isn't as helpful for all of you, maybe it still is, is um, one of my mentors when I was here at Taylor encouraged me to do this while I was still at Taylor during one of the, the summer breaks. And that was to in, intentionally visit as many different churches as possible 
during that, that summer experience to get a feel for what the options were upcoming. Because I was only, and, and to, that wasn't in number, but that was in experiences. So I really tried to do things like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try the full spectrum of Christian churches. I'm gonna go to a Catholic church and an Orthodox church. I'm gonna go to um, something that really has high liturgy. I'm gonna go to a, a charismatic church. I'm gonna go to an African American church. I'm gonna go to right, I, um, a fundamentalist church, an evangelical church. Right, really tried, that was what I meant by different. Not, I'm going to this church and this church and this church, right? But really trying to explore like what the full range of experiences at a church would be like. Because um, before that, growing up, my parents are missionaries. And so I had been to a lot of churches where they were raising support. But a lot of those churches, to be honest, were were very similar to each other. Most of them were some form of a evangelical uh, church that had very similar worship style, very similar order of worship, very similar belief system, um, and, and, and so forth. It wasn't until I did this kind of experience, experiment that I, I experienced a much wider um, swath of what uh, a Sunday morning uh, can be like. Now, I didn't get the full experience because I wasn't investing in those churches, and so I wasn't experiencing what it's like to have community. I wasn't experiencing what a small group might be like at these churches and stuff. But it, it, it was a very helpful experience for me. So um, if that's something that you guys uh, can, can do, um, I, I think it's worth uh, experiencing um, and, and helping inform your decision. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I I forget who wrote this. I, I've read some of your responses to today's um, uh, topic, and I I thought it was really important and something that we should talk about here today, and that is. Um, that everything we're talking about assumes that um, going back to church is, is going to be easy. And what might church be like in a, uh, if the pandemic does not get better um, when, when you leave? Um, so I, I'm sorry I'm not, I, Attributing that to, to whoever wrote that in your thing, but I think that was very helpful because the, the reality is you might be saying, well, how do I visit a church when the church is only available in some online format? Um, so I think that's worth, I, this is something I don't have an experience uh, in, or I can't draw an experience. So I'd like to hear what you think. How, what do you feel like this spring could, might be if you're going to some new place and the pandemic doesn't get better. Yeah. I don't know if this is like the, the right attitude to have, but if it's in a way that where we're on a stricter lockdown and virtual church is more of a thing again, I feel like I have the temptation to just keep watching the live streams of the church I'm currently at, even though I'm in the new place. Um, I think the better thing would be to try to watch different live streams, but if I have to be home anyway, I'd probably just listen to the church right now. Okay. Yeah, Kendall. I had a friend who moved, who graduated last year, not from Taylor, from a different uh, school, he moved to Denver for a few months, and then he injured his hand and had to move back to Cincinnati, where he's from. And he, for a while, was watching the live stream of the church that he was going to Denver, slash the small group that he had to go 
going to one third of the sessions, and after a couple of weeks, he just couldn't do anymore because he wasn't with them in person and just like felt like he didn't want to put the time for his community that he wasn't doing so he would be able to do anything. Yeah. So that was kind of disturbing to hear because like ideally it'd be like, oh yeah, I could watch and personally join the community of a church I'm I'm not around, but Yeah, just like on over quarantine, like at the church I go to back at home, they they share their conviction of church when it's not in person isn't really church at all. And so that actually helped me a lot to just say like I want to be in person with a good church. I'm uh -huh. sort of looking forward to how can I be in person with people I know. Mm -hmm. That push was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it, it would be very hard. I, even for me on sabbatical this spring, I was able to at least connect with the church in Berkeley we were at for a couple of months before I had to do it online. And that did make a big difference. Um, we, uh, I, I, I don't feel like our family has felt reconnected back to our church here in Upland because of the, the disconnect. That being gone for six months for sabbatical and then coming back and continuing to do online church, um, it, it does definitely feel disconnecting. It does feel like we're not, um, we're not doing church completely fully it's it's less than it could and should be so i mean i am hoping i am praying that our pandemic uh, does not extend for for years, um, but if it does, I I can see how difficult this would be for all of you who are going to new places, because no matter what you do, whether you're watching the church from a distance, or you're trying to participate in a church that you've never attended, there, I would imagine both experiences would feel missing some out on something. If you're distant, well, I'm never going to be back, well, or I'll rarely be back with them distance. If I'm connected, how can, who do I talk to? Why do I talk to them? How do I Why do I connect with this group versus that group? How do I invest? How do I get invested in? Those are really hard questions. I hope you don't have to answer. But I do think that it would be better to be prepared for it as a possibility, then, well, it won't take you by surprise. I think it did this spring, right? But to, to just assume it's going to go away and then and be wrong. So I would encourage, and that's probably true of a lot of your life. Church is just going to be one aspect of that. How? Is life going to be effective for you if you're more stay at home, less attend these things? Uh, that doesn't sound like a very fun option.
Um, Going through my mental checklist, making sure I talk about everything I wanted to talk about today. Um, I think this is. I think this is a really important topic. I think that. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of Taylor graduates. Who don't see it as important, and it's it's the beginning of their pulling away uh, from a connection to the church becomes a pulling away from the connection with Christ becomes a pulling away from um, all things spiritual. Um, and hopefully. At this point, as seniors, you have built up the routine and the habit of going to a church, and so you don't have to start that from scratch. Um, but I know that um, many of you uh, are in a similar position to, to where I was when I graduated, where um, I kind of attended church every Sunday, but there wasn't really a connection point for me at the church. Like Taylor was my community, um, and Taylor was where I uh, was looking for most of my uh, spiritual growth. Um, and so it was difficult for me to make that transition, not to show up on church on Sunday and maintain that um, discipline, but to turn it into more than just showing up on Sunday. That was what was new and was difficult for me. Um, and so I would like to encourage you, if that's where you are at here at Taylor, to figure out how you can begin to prepare yourself to translate from, I'm just showing up to church on Sunday, if I'm doing that, to uh, really connecting with the church and, and making that, learning how to make that a, a true community as as a as that it is what your future has um, in store for it. Um, and it was a hard transition for me. Um, and so just like the last chapter, the author talks about it can be hard to build friendships. Um, it can be hard to develop this, this community um, at first. Um, that's, that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, uh, do you have any questions? Let me know. Um, Next week, I forget what we're talking about. Is it the diversity? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Talking about diversity. Um, uh, so I'm going to have a little bit more out of class uh, reading and um, watching to lead, to lead for the discussion for, for next week. Uh, so be prepared for that. Um, thank you, everyone.
I hope you have a good evening um, preparing for, for Saturday. And I look forward to hearing all the good advice that you have for the freshmen from then. I'll see you guys then.